Nutrigenomics, well, I'm sure the word's been used many times already in this conference, and of course we understand that in its simplest form, it's really just food talking to our genes. But what I found when I um, embarked on my research project in this field is that whilst I had um, background in nutrition and biochemistry on the left-hand side of the slide, I knew very little about genomics. And so when one tries to learn nutrigenomics, it's a blending of several disciplines, which then relates ultimately to interpreting this information in the context of human health. And um, nutrigenomics is just an over-encompassing term which looks at a whole lot of different omics, uh, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and there's a few other omics that have turned up more recently. But the one that seems to get most attention is methylation. And important as methylation is, it's just one part of that nutrigenomics puzzle. So about 10 years ago, the Human Genome Project was completed. And um, out of that, the entire human genome was mapped and um, we learnt a lot of new things from that. First of all, it's overwhelming to look at 25,000 or 30,000 human genes. We haven't uh, the slightest knowledge of what a lot of those genes mean, but we're on the cusp of this new paradigm, and I think we're starting to learn a lot about a whole group of primary genes which are governing how cells function. And those are the ones that I'm most interested in. And I'm also very interested in biomolecules which have the ability to switch on and switch off certain regulatory genes. And that's part of what my research is associated with. So we look at these food-derived molecules now as activators of complex signalling systems or switches. And if we you know, look at a complex um, biochemical diagram here, you'll perhaps recognise NF-kappa-B there, which we know is the transcription factor which uh, governs the production of inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the one I'm most interested in is NRF NRF2, which doesn't get uh, quite the press it needs, but um, I'm hoping to change that at least in part today. Uh, in diabetic medicine, we know about PPR-gamma. So these are signalling factors and we now understand that we have the ability to control those signalling molecules in ways we didn't before have. And I see this information as underpinning a whole new paradigm in how we practice um, nutritional medicine. So I started practice in 1975, which is a very long time ago, and we were talking then about the importance of antioxidants, and I think we're still talking about it. And I do believe that for six decades we've probably embraced what is, in part, some flawed logic. We've worked on the fundamental premise that all free radicals are bad and all antioxidants are good. Now, I know that's highly simplistic, but the reality is it's actually not correct. We're going to look at why that might be. And you might notice on, on most of my slides where I write the word antioxidant, I've got it in parentheses because I think it's a bit of a misnomer in the way we have uh, defined it. So the old model of nutri nutritional medicine, and that's the one that I embarked on practice um, in 1975, was largely about correcting deficiencies, often using mega doses of various nutrients. Again, the theory was underpinned by the idea that free radicals were bad and antioxidants were good and we had to get rid of all those free radicals at all costs. And a belief that antioxidants and so-called antioxidant supplements were what promoted cell defence. And there's a leap of faith in there which I think is where we've gone off on the wrong track. We also then extrapolated that to say that because we knew that people who ate large amounts of plant food were often the healthiest, and because vitamin C was an important component of plant food, therefore, if we give high doses of vitamin C, we will be doing what Mother Nature does, and therefore, we will promote health. And um, 
Linus Pauling's concept of giving large doses of, of vitamin C has been uh, a concept that we've used clinically for a very long time. I suspect that if Pauling was still here today, eminent scientist as he was, he may very well have modified his thinking in light of what we've learnt uh, since his passing. I also remember as um, a young and new practitioner talking about Roger Williams, who was a contemporary of Pauling, and his concept of biochemical individuality. And we were so very proud of the fact that we were embracing biochemical individuality. The truth is, we had absolutely no tools whatsoever to deal with any such individuality. So we just gave our patients megadoses in the hope that somehow or other we would force these enzymes in our cells to go where we wanted them to go. And in truth, we had a fairly limited understanding of cell defence mechanisms. And of course, biochemical individuality is pretty interesting because we can have people like um, Grandma here who's lighting her candles at 100 years of age with a cigarette. Good for her. I don't think most of us have her genes, and I certainly don't have this girl's genes either. So yes, we're individual, uh, and we haven't always known why that might be. So enter the concept of nutrigenetics. So this is not nutrigenomics. This is the opposite. This is nutrigenetics. And so this says, OK, I'm born with a certain gene profile that I inherited partly from my mother and partly from my father. And it will tell me how I can handle the environment. So I might have certain genes that help me to detoxify caffeine quickly so I can drink coffee all day, all night, and it doesn't keep me awake. That isn't me, incidentally, but I could be. Um, some people smoke large amounts of cigarettes and don't get lung cancer. So that's the nutrigenetic profile that has enabled them to have those unique abilities. And until fairly recently, we didn't know what those genes were. Now we're starting to get a handle on this, and this is very useful information clinically. I believe if we can look at a patient's gene profile and look at the ones who sh you know, really should not be smoking. I'm not suggesting anybody should, but some people, of course, have greater risk than others. Then we look at the other side of the coin, the nutrigenomics, and that tells us what sorts of food chemicals can send certain messages to our DNA. Because certain food chemicals we now know are activating some of those switches within the cells. So switches like NF-kappa-B, eat, eat plenty of junk food and you'll switch on your NF-kappa-B. Eat plenty of the sorts of foods which are on this slide and you'll tend to switch on the cytoprotective pathways which are governed by NRF2 as a transcription factor.